So we're in a series called The Superhero Parables, and uh, we are telling stories of superheroes, but then connecting them to Scripture and learning some stories and lessons about how to love God and love people and make disciples, students of Jesus who make disciples. Um, so Ant-Man's first appearance was in a comic called Tales to Astonish, it's number 27. That was in January of 1962, and the story was entitled The Man in the Ant Hill. And so it was about a guy named Hank Pym, who was a brilliant scientist, but he was often mocked and ridiculed by his colleagues at the annual science convention. Boy, do I know what that's like. And so several months after one convention, after spending months alone in the laboratory working and planning, Hank Pym in the comic book holds up a, 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 you know, a test tube filled with fluid, and he says, it works, I've done it. I've reduced this chair to a doll size. And he has this chair that he shrunk. And uh, he says, now I have to apply a few drops of my growth potion and the chair returns again to its normal size. This is the greatest triumph I have ever known. Soon I'll have my serums perfected. Then I shall be able to change the size of any object. What a boon it will be to mankind. So his vision, and this is not a joke in the comic, his vision is that you can use the potion to shrink down packages and send them for cheaper, and then people can like bring them back to normal size to like save money on Amazon when, that, when that's a thing. Uh, but his other vision for it is that you can shrink an entire army, put them on one plane, send them where they go, and then bring them back to regular size. And so he has these visions for how his serums would be used. The only thing left to do is to test it on a living object, a living creature, and that, of course, is himself. So he puts a couple drops in his arm, and he shrinks much quicker than he ever would have expected. And he realizes immediately his mistake is he left the growth serum up on the windowsill, which is now like flights above him, you know, in his perspective. And so then from there, honestly, it's a pretty awful story. It's terrible. And like, so he goes outside, he falls down an anthill, and he ends up landing in honey, because they're honey ants, and one ant rescues him from the honey, but then the rest start like creeping up on him and cornering him in the ant nest down underground, and he sees a match sticking up out of the ground. He's like, I have to hit that match with this rock this pebble, and start a fire, and he throws it, and the match strikes, and a fire starts in the ant nest. He creates a lasso, which is the answer to everything in the 50s and 60s. I, gotta, I need a lasso. He creates a lasso to throw up the hole, to get out of the hole. As he goes up the hole, he's confronted by one more ant, which he says, I will use the art of judo on this ant, and he, he actually says that. He fights the ant. Then when he gets outside, the savior ant Basically, he's like, hey, hop on, you know, he, not through communication, but he hops on the ant's back, takes him up the wall of his house to the growth serum inside of the window. So when he takes the growth serum, he destroys both serums. Like, these are way too dangerous to have in the world. I must destroy them. So he destroys both serums. Now, it doesn't seem so much like this story was originally intended to be a superhero story. It was kind of like this one-off you know, of like, here's this random story about a guy who shrinks, goes down to an anthill. No hero at all whatsoever. But a few months later, Return of the Ant-Man. Just a few issues later in Tales to Astonish. And this is the first time that we see Ant-Man in his costume. And the issue begins by saying, as a quick recap, in a previous issue of this magazine, the nightmarish story of Henry Pym, a scientist who invented two incredible serums, one to reduce objects, and another to enlarge them back to their normal size. And the second issue of this Ant-Man story goes on to talk about how he recreates, he concocts, he you know makes those serums again, but this time he hides them in a safe in his office because he knows that they could be really dangerous to the world. And then secretly he continues to study ants, and he, he learns a bunch about ants, and he creates a special cybernetic helmet that enables him to communicate with ants on their wavelength through an antennae. And so it protects him also from accidental stings and bites from ants. Meanwhile, uh, on a side plot, the government comes to Henry Pym for his regular scientific job, and they have a job for him. They say, we want you to create an anti-radiation formula, a gas that makes people immune to radioactivity. 
And so when foreign spies somewhere on the other side of the world find out about this in the comic book, um, they send spies to Henry Pym's, you know, laboratory and his scientists, teams of scientists, and they come to steal it. And they come loaded with gats and heaters. And they come in, and uh, thank you very much. And uh, everybody else like, gats and heaters? What are those? Um, so... They come in strapped, and he runs and hides in the office. He's like, what am I going to do? They're here to steal the stuff that we're creating for the government. He's like, ah, I have in my safe some serums. And so basically, he shrinks himself with a serum from his safe. He decreases his size. He commands an army of ants. He, you know, foils the plans of the foreign spies, saves the day, and then at the end, he dips himself in the enlarging serum. And at the end of the issue... Henry Pym thinks it's over. The danger has ended for now, and my secret is still, still safe. But I wonder, will I ever be forced to become the Ant-Man again? And the narration in the final chapter says, yes, Henry Pym, you will. So at Momentum, we love God's Word, and usually we'll put chunks of Scripture, and there'll be Scripture that we'll put up there verbatim today. Um, but to switch things up, since we're in comic book style series, we thought we'd go with comic book style Bible. This is the Action Bible. It's really sweet, very cool, very visual, and that's what I'm kind of using our stories from today. So today we're looking at a guy whose name is John the Baptist. So after the Christmas story of God coming into the world in the flesh, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, we're introduced to a really important person, John the Baptist. The Baptist is really just kind of a nickname to differentiate him from other Johns. But he's John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. I call, I call him J the B. Okay, so um, this is not the fisherman John who we'll learn about later, one of Jesus' 12 disciples. That's John's son of Zebedee. And that's who wrote the gospel book that we're going to be in today, the gospel of John. But this is a different John, John the Baptist, J the B. All right, so in the Action Bible, it introduces him, and it says this. It says, John, son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, he grows up with God's call on his heart. As an adult, he meditates in the desert, and there he hears, God's, he hears God calling him. Uh, he, he begins, go back, he begins, back, 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 he begins preaching forcefully all around the Jordan River. And then John says, him saying to everyone, stop sinning, be baptized, God's kingdom is very near. And he's dressed in camel's hair and all this stuff. But uh, it says, John doesn't have a lot of patience for people who live in luxury and ignore God. Then, it goes on to the next, and it says, news spreads far and wide about the man who looks and speaks like a prophet. Curious crowds come to hear John the Baptist, but some assuming he's talking about other people's sins. And he says, do you think that just because you are Jews, as he is, you will be allowed in God's kingdom? You must repent First, repent means turn from your way, turn to God's way. And so one of his famous lines that John the Baptist said was, if you have extra clothes, share with someone who has none. If you have extra food, give it away, give it away, give it away now. And so that was John the Baptist. This is a quote from John the Baptist. Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, next slide. And so, uh, it says, scoffers turn away, but many people listen carefully. They wonder if John might be more than a simple prophet. Are you the Savior God has promised us? No, I baptize with water, but he, the Savior, will baptize with the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit. He says, get ready, the Savior is coming. So, he keeps baptizing people in the Jordan River. He's out there preaching repentance, turn to God. And it says, John doesn't know it, but the Savior is in the crowd one day. Jesus has come down from Nazareth to hear John speak, and he asks to be baptized. And John says to Jesus, why do you come to me to be baptized? I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. And then Jesus speaks and says, John, God chose you to introduce me to the world. Now, one interesting thing is that in the scriptures, it talks about how John has his own disciples. You know, Jesus, it's famous that he had 12 main disciples. John has disciples. And if you read the Gospel of John, chapter 1, you see that some of John the Baptist's disciples leave him 
and go to follow Jesus. And they become Jesus' disciples, which makes sense because John's out in the wilderness. He's like, I'm not the one. There's one coming after me. I'm not worthy to tie his sandals, man. I'm not worthy to tie his Jordans. I'm not worthy of that. And so all of a sudden Jesus comes along and John's like, that's the guy. Behold the dude. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. So it's so natural that some of his disciples would be like, wait, you've been saying you're not the guy, that's the guy, and there he is? Oh, well, let's go follow this guy. So some of his disciples go follow Jesus. But in John chapter 3, after that happens, it says this. Some of John's disciples, so he still has some disciples, come to John and they say to him, Rabbi, the one you testified about, look, He's baptizing, and everyone's going to him. So like, wait a minute, John. Remember, you're John the Baptist. You're Jay the B. He's baptizing. That's your thing. What's he doing? Like, and everybody's going to him to get baptized. Now it's our thing. We're doing it. He should be over here. That's what we do. You're John the Baptist. So they're like they're ticked about it. So John goes into a little chunk of teaching then, and he says this. The friend who attends or serves or takes care of the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. Picture him saying this with a smile on his face like, my joy is now complete in that. What he's saying is, Jesus is the groom. Like, I'm just the best man. I'm just going to translate it to our culture. But there was a very specific role that the person he's talking about, the friend of the groom, played. It, in our culture, it would be like the best man. But it would almost be more the level of what the, uh, what's the main bridesmaid call? Uh, the, the maid of honor. What she would do, just the way she serves, 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 fix the train. Th that's kind of what he's talking about here. But the best man serves the groom and finds joy in making everything about him like making speeches about him, celebrating him, toasting him, making him look good, seeing him pleased and celebrated. He's like, that's my job. Jesus is the groom. So he's like, life is a wedding. Jesus is the groom. I'm the best man. My job is to serve Jesus and make everything about him. And man, that brings me joy to complete that task. So there's no sense of jealousy, no sense of envy or rivalry from John the Baptist, he's the man, he's the man. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. But then check out what John the Baptist says in verse 30, and this is our main key verse for today. He talks about the best man versus the groom thing. And then I want you to listen closely because the Scottish biblical scholar F.F. F. Bruce points out that these are John's last recorded words in this gospel. This is his way to do a mic drop for John the Baptist. The last thing he says is, he must increase, but I must decrease. Okay, so increase in the original language in the Greek, increase means what you probably think it would mean. It means to increase, to grow up, to enlarge. He must increase. To decrease means kind of connotation to decrease in authority and popularity. So one thing is on an upward trend, and the other is on a downward trend. He's got to increase. I've got to decrease. And at this time, I mean, the baptism of Jesus is him going public with his public ministry. I mean, he's been living in most obscurity to this point. And so now Jesus is increasing in buzz, popularity, influence, relationship, leadership, followers, social media presence. You know, all of a sudden, Jesus got, he's got, oh my gosh, he's got a Facebook, he's got a Twitter, all that stuff. Jesus' kingdom is growing. Jesus' is church, if you will, is growing. John's is shrinking. Followers of John are leaving to go follow Jesus. And so John the Baptist is saying, man, I must decrease. Like, my kingdom must decrease. My kingdom, what I'm building here, must decrease, and his kingdom must increase. I must point people to, attach people to, connect people to Jesus, not connect them, attach them, point them to myself. It's about me attaching people to Jesus. My role isn't to be famous. My role is to make him famous. And I wonder if John the Baptist like ever got frustrated with the point that he still had disciples, right? Because like, that's the guy, that's the guy. Hey, what are we going to do next, John? Why are you still following me? 
What are you doing here? Okay, like, I wonder if he got frustrated with that. Like, you're not hearing my message. Okay, keep following me for a little while until you get it. You know, like, that's the guy. That's the guy. Like, I'm just the opening band. He's the Foo Fighters. Go. Follow him. Like, no, man, we want to be with this obscure band. Okay, whatever. He just constantly, he's the man, he's the man, he's the man. Now, Ant-Man is unique among superhero concepts because anytime you hear an origin story, it seems like the typical thing is someone receives powers, and through those powers, they become bigger, faster, stronger, muscles like the hawk. They're ripped. They need a suit that accentuates their pectorals. You know, they're, I mean, all of a sudden, they're bigger, they're badder. But this is a totally different concept. The Ant-Man becomes a hero by getting smaller. That's really unique. It's, it's, an, it's, it's an ability that's very similar to becoming invisible. Like all of a sudden, you, whoop, you can shrink down smaller, smaller, smaller. So becoming Ant-Man means to decrease, to become less visible, to become less obtrusive. The idea is, you know, some of... The best hero work is done at the Ant-Man level, where you don't even really see it. It's almost invisible, but it's still affecting change. And I'll be honest, when Ant-Man as a film came out the first time they were advertised, I had no interest. I was like, that sounds lame. I don't go, Ant-Man? Who cares? That sounds stupid. Because I like big, tough superheroes. Ant-Man He's going like, like, that is so dumb. And it won me over with its playfulness and its fun and all that kind of stuff. Like, oh, man, I like Ant-Man now. But it took a while because it's like, that, there's nothing, that's not cool. That's, there's nothing sexy about Ant-Man. He's this little thing, you know. It's like, that's not, that's not, that's not cool. Then think about the terms we use when it comes to this. Like, when you think about things being great or large or elevated, think about this terminology we use. Like, man, she thinks she's so great. Um, you know, he's, he's kind of big-headed, he's kind of bloated, inflated, you know, overblown. He's a little puffed up when you think about, like, character. Uh, she, man, she's got her nose in the air. She's always looking down on others. Oh, he's so superior. He's on his high horse. He's, oh, man, sometimes you may say this of, like, maybe your son. Oh, he's getting a little big for his britches, isn't he? You know, that kind of stuff. Like, my boss, he's so high and mighty, so lofty, or my favorite, he's so highfalutin. Isn't that a great word? You can use that today. High fully. But pride, the idea of pride is I get a big head. I get puffed up. That's the opposite of Ant-Man. I get enlarged. My view of myself is way too big. You won't even fit through the door. Your head's so big. But compare that to like the small and lowly language and the words we use for humility. Low profile. He's kind of low key. She's, you know, she's humble. She's modest. I was given a modest slice of pie. It's small, you know, unassuming, unobtrusive. It's, these are small words. And so the idea of Ant-Man, John the Baptist was Ant-Man. I must decrease so that people can see Jesus. I must decrease so that he increases. And man, that brings me joy. There's no rivalry. Like I've, this week I had to start picturing myself, uh, I had to picture John the Baptist saying that with a joyful smile on his face. I, I must decrease. He must increase. That's actually God's plan. It's God's will that he increased. So is Jesus increasing in your life? Are you decreasing? Are you shrinking, becoming the ant man, getting out of the way so that people can see Jesus? You know, are you the song and dance show in front of Jesus? You're so much attention to yourself, no one can see Jesus behind you. Like, oh, okay, I got to decrease, I got to decrease so that people can see Jesus. Uh, my buddy Tim Jones, who speaks here about once a year, he told me about a Christian author and speaker whose name is Tim Larson. And Tim Larson, when he first became a Christian, his wife did not. She was actually uh, kind of resentful of him, and his faith was kind of a point of contention for a little while. And when he'd go to speak at churches, sometimes he'd say to, like, the leadership of the churches, because he was a speaker, like, man, will you guys please pray for my wife? I, I so long for her to be a follower of Jesus. And right now, it's, we're, like, butting heads over the faith stuff. And man, I want her to follow Jesus. And so he was just like, man, I don't know what to do about this. But funny enough, one of the points of contention in his household, him and his wife, in their marriage was who takes out the garbage? Now, before we throw stones at him, you know, 
a lot of people have really stupid things they fight over. This was their stupid thing. You know, it's like, who's going to take out the garbage? Because he grew up in a culture of a home where, like, that's not something the man does. It's like, it's like you know, that's, that's housework. That's something she does. She came from a home where it was like, the guys were like, oh, we wouldn't let a lady do that. That's, this, is man, you know, this is what a man does, takes out the garbage so a lady doesn't have to handle garbage. So they're just different cultures of homes. And so whenever the, the waste basket was full, you know, every day and a half or whatever, like, oh, it's just it's flowing. It's, come on, dude, why didn't you take this out? Last thing you put on here, it's overflowing. So they're always bickering about who takes the garbage. Well, one day he just decided, he was praying. He was like, God, you know, you know, what do I do? He's praying about it. He said he felt like God just gave him a picture of the garbage, the trash, he just brought it to mind. He was like, oh, okay, God, I'll take out the trash. It's like, man, this is so stupid. But he's like, I guess I have to become Ant-Man in my home. I have to start being a servant at home. So he started taking, fine, God, I'll take out the garbage. And so he did it for a few weeks. And, you know, it sounds like some church camp skit. But after a few weeks, it started creating conversation. Why are you suddenly, after being such a butt about it all the time, why are you suddenly always taking out the garbage right, right before it gets all full, you know, whatever? And it created conversations. A few weeks later, she's going to church with him. Eventually, his wife was a Christian. Why? Because he became Ant-Man. He decreased so that she could see Jesus in him. Jesus increasing, him decreasing, his friends praying for her. And, and Ant-Man comes through, saves the day. She saw Jesus through him becoming smaller. And I'm telling you, like, you know, being Ant-Man doesn't just have the power or the potential to save your marriage, because it does. It has the power and the potential to save your marriage. It also has the power and potential to save the people you love. I mean, you decreasing so they can see Jesus. You becoming, bending down, becoming lower, getting smaller. You know, over and over in Scripture, we're commanded to take Ant-Man's shrinking potion for our big heads. We're, we're commanded for our high and lofty views, looking down our nose at other people. Over and over in Scripture, it commands, humble yourself. Many different writers in Scripture, humble yourself. For instance, James 4.10, humble yourself, yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And humble is a verb. I mean, obviously, it means lower yourself. Bring yourself down. Deflate yourself. And, and the funny thing is, is a lot of times in the Bible, when it talks about humbling ourselves, humble yourself, humble yourself humble yourself. It's not just before God. It's also before others. It's both. So none of this, oh, yes, I, I humble myself before God, but I ain't serving anybody. Okay, well, that's not, I mean, both are in there. Uh, 1 Peter 5, written by the spokesperson of Jesus' 12 disciples, Simon Peter, he says this, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility. Put on humility like Ant-Man's costume. Put it on. Clothe yourself with humility. Toward who? One another. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Notice there's always this elevation that comes from you lowering, lowering yourself. God elevates you as you lower yourself. So bend down. Humble yourself. Become small. I love, you know, like, that mean I have to think less of myself. I have to devalue myself? Absolutely not. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking, of your, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. That is humility. A week before Easter, Ashley Bachna posted, uh, hey, if you're looking for a place to worship this Easter, come to Momentum. I'll sit in the front row so you don't have to. Because no, and like auditoriums are pretty full, you know, on Easter. But she, that, that, and she did. She sat in the front row. That's Ant-Man. You know, that's I will shrink. My desires, preferences, wants, comforts, they decline so that other people can see Jesus. Um, the, the famous best-selling book by Rick Warren, uh, Purpose Driven Life. Um, I, I'm just being honest. It wasn't my favorite book, you know. Like, I, I don't even know if I made it all the way through it. You know, I kept chipping, chipping. But the first line was gold. First line is worth the price of the whole book. And the first line is just simply, it's not about you. That's how the book starts. Like, yep, that's a good message to receive pretty much daily. It's not about me. Like, I have to decrease so that people can see you. I make it about me. That's me, me. It's my kingdom. It's attaching people to me, connecting people to me. 
decrease. I have to decrease so people can see Jesus. Um, so most of the, the film fans, the MCU fans, Marvel, Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, most of them have heard of the multiverse, the multiverse. Um, but a lot of people haven't heard of the microverse. So the microverse comes from the comic books, and the microverse was first mentioned in 1947 in the comics, but it was further explained in 1964. Um, the microverse is like a microscopic universe, uh, a dimension so small, they say it's like between two atoms. You know, it's a subatomic kind of universe. And so it, it's said in the comics that the microverse holds the universe together. And in the comics, the microverse was the home to just an onslaught of characters, including uh, notably the Micronauts. Anybody remember those toys from the 80s that became comic book characters, Micronauts? Well, the MCU, the films, they didn't have the licensing for the Micronauts. And of course, Ant-Man, this is the level that he gets down to, is like a subatomic kind of level, level that he can get to, microscopic or whatever. And so they didn't have the licensing for Micronauts, so they uh, changed the name to the quantum realm and that's what we're the quantum mania that's all that's in the films because they didn't have the licensing for the microverse uh and so in the movies quantum realm or in the comics microverse they say that's kind of like the basement to the multiverse you know that's going on in the films right now but you know the idea of becoming ant-man is to get down to that level what does it look like to serve in the microverse what does it look like to get down that far that I'm willing to go that low to serve in places that sometimes it's almost invisible? Um, you know, Mo Kids volunteers. You know, I think about how on a Sunday morning, you know, I'm in and out of here, this room preaching three times, going and getting more coffee and fist bumping and all that kind of stuff. But it occurs to me a lot of times, I don't even know on a given Sunday who served in Mo Kids. You know, like, because they're just, they're off at the quantum level, the basement. They're down so far in the basement in this other microverse. They have humbled themselves so low. They're in the basement with kids all morning, like loving on kids. And, and so they lower themselves to work with kids. Like, think about it. All morning speaking at kids' levels. All morning teaching at their level, worshiping at their level, playing games with them at their level, bending down to give them fist bumps, getting down to take a knee to talk to them eye to eye. Like, man, that is noble, noble ministry. Like, that is Ant-Man, serving at that level. And honestly, like, there's people that have been doing it for years, like Mike Love's one example in the back row. There's so many kids that when Mike Love walks through the lobby, they're like, there goes my hero. Like, because he's down there playing on a basketball hoop that's this big, and he can do LeBron dunks on that thing or whatever, and he's just punking kids down there. But... He's been serving kids down there forever, and they're like, man, he's ordinary. But he's down there serving us, talking eye to eye, with, talking about things that we love, we do, instruments we play. Like, that is just noble, noble ministry. I must decrease so that kids can see Jesus because I'm down there serving at the microverse level. Not to mention moms and dads who come home exhausted from work and get down on the floor and play with their kids hang with their kids, tickle their kids, put the kids on their back and walk around like they're an elephant, do stupid stuff like that, but also tell Bible stories on their kids' levels, speak to them about God on their kids' levels. Man, I'm, I'm so proud and thankful for a church that just as a team, as an army, just continues to become more of an army of ants, you know, like people who are all in this process and some haven't even started the process yet, but there's so many people who serve on the Ant-Man level, just who serve in the microverse. Like, there are so many servant-hearted people. It humbles me anytime. I know nothing about cars, but when there is someone who is willing to go to the Ant-Man level and bend down, shrink down, in probably the regular clothes for that day, and crawl under my car to look up under it and be like, here's what I think your issue is. Every time that happens, I'm, I am humbled by their humility to crawl on the dirty ground under my car. That is Ant-Man hero stuff. Because I don't know anything about cars, and they do that for other people who don't know anything about cars, and they shrink down to that level, bend down to serve and humble themselves. Um, our, our tech team serves at the Ant-Man level. Dude, they, I mean, it's their job, we often say, is just it's to eliminate distractions during worship so that people can see Jesus. 
and worship Jesus. That's the idea of the tech room is what do they do? They try to eliminate distractions so people can see Jesus. But they themselves are largely unseen. They're not even allowed to come in this room. We bore a hole in the wall and made a cave for them. We thought about making it a two-way mirror. Like, we don't even want to look at them. We don't want to look at them. But no, man, our tech team, give it up for our tech team. That's part of them back there. Some of them are sitting in here. It's just their week off, you know, with the rotation stuff. But man, like great, I mean, just sound, slides, lights, MoChurch.tv production, masters and apprentices, servant at an ant man level. And then there are servant-hearted people who get down on the floor and scrub and clean up after others and clean our toilets. I mean, where dudes have peed in a six-foot radius on the floor, there are people that go in there and are mopping and cleaning and putting new urinal biscuits or whatever goes on. Cleaning, our momentum cleaning team, especially Keona Jones, who we cannot thank enough for leading the cleaning team because she is a great woman. I mean, she is Ant-Man, no doubt. And one of the things that Jesus said, you know, he tells his disciples, Whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant. Like, it's this upside-down kingdom thing. Like, you want to be great, you want to be large, the way you do it is you become Ant-Man. You become a servant. You humble yourself. You shrink down to the level where you're willing to humble yourself before others and serve others. I must decrease myself. And Ant-Man becomes a hero by getting smaller. Um, now, on the other side of that, I know there are a few temperaments and people in the room who I probably just need to say this quickly for is some of you just serve relentlessly, relentlessly, relentlessly. And uh, one of the things I just want to kind of say that John the Baptist said, it says a couple times that John free, confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. Okay? Sometimes maybe there are people who need to admit that too. Like, I, I am not the Messiah. Okay? Like, Uh, You know, maybe that's something, you know, just to confirm, I am not the Savior in my workplace. I'm not the Savior in my family. I'm not the Savior for my non-Christian boyfriend or girlfriend. I am not the Savior. I can serve, but it doesn't just end all with me. Like, some people go beyond serving to what you'd call enabling. Like, these are things that people have to learn to do for themselves. Like, you know, it's really tempting when you're parenting to like, you can make the mistake of, of shielding your kids from everything that's hard or scary. Like instead of trying to like coach them through things that are hard or scary, walk them through, give them advice, coach them through it, I just eliminate, because John the Baptist came to make paths straight, right? That's what he came to do. I'm just making paths straight. No, if you eliminate everything hard and scary, for, that's called enabling, and it's not helpful, it's harmful. And so sometimes people just go too far because really when it comes down to it, you know, it's, it's based on maybe your need to please people, you know, or, or to be the Messiah, to be the Savior. And John the Baptist is like, it's not me. It's I'm going to serve and I'm going to decrease so that people can see Jesus. But it, it just, it can't all just be me. And I can't just find my identity in nonstop doing everything for everyone and paying my adult children's bills and doing all that's enabling. Um, Tony Amishlocker, which is just a fun last name to say, my last name's Smith, and you fall asleep halfway through it, you know. But Tony Amishlocker, that's cool. Uh, he was one of the speakers at a Christian convention uh, called, it was Kentucky Christian University, my alma mater. They had this teen convention for uh, Christian teens and kids checking out Jesus called Summer in the Sun, S O N. See what they did there? And so, it was in the summer, too, by the way. It was in June. So anyways, Tony would speak at that. I, I knew him from that or knew of him. He, he doesn't know me. I'm just a little peon. Um, but uh, he, he grew up in L.A., and his parents weren't Christians. His dad was this, like, grizzled, tough guy cop uh, in L.A., um, LAPD. And so, but he was also this vile womanizer. And so he cheated on his mom all the time. It was pretty disgusting. Uh, so Tony became a Christian in high school, and when Tony's dad found out, he just verbally assaulted him, just spewed rage and disappointment on him. And I was like, oh, that part of the story sounds familiar. And so, um, well, his parents eventually split up. His mom divorced his dad, which makes complete sense. Uh, but unfortunately, she just became a raging alcoholic. And uh, eventually, though, in a strange turn of events, Tony's dad became a Christian, this grizzled old cop or whatever. And so he was, you know, he was a new Christian, 
So, you know, he was kind of rough around the edges, kind of gruff and grumpy, still cussed a little bit like some of you. And uh, eventually Tony's dad, though, uh, went to her house to visit her. And I think the connotation was that Tony's mom was sick and, you know, or maybe in depression or whatever. She's drinking a lot and all this stuff. And Tony's dad shows up to visit his ex-wife, goes to her house, and goes in to speak with her, but she won't even look at him. She turns in her bed, looks out the window, won't speak to him, and just turns her back to him. It's like, okay. So he tries that a couple times, and, you know, she just won't speak to him, stares out the window, and he's, like, talking to himself in the room. He's like, oh, this is so stupid. So he calls Tony for advice, which freaks Tony out. He's like, my dad calls me for advice, like, you know, who's kind of a bully, you know, I know he's a Christian now, and he's changing, but yeah, this is really weird, so his dad's like, I keep trying to visit her, but she just turns and stares out the window, he's like, well, you were pretty horrible to her, dad, like, you were a pretty awful husband, you cheated on her, like, you were terrible, and uh, so he's like, what do you want me to do, I mean, like, that's all, that's years ago now, what do you want me to do, what do you want me to do, and he's like, maybe apologize to her, like, there's maybe a starting point, like, maybe you could apologize. Well, he didn't like that. He goes, oh, screw that. I'm not apologizing. That's a dumb idea. I'm not doing that crap. And he c- cussed Tony out just a little bit because he's a Christian now. So he just cussed him out a little bit. And then he hung up. And uh, Christians still hang up on people. When you're a really good Christian, you hang up and tell markers right away. So, but apparently the Holy Spirit's working on Tony's dad because after that conversation with Tony, it's like, Ugh. And so God's Spirit starts working on him and dad shows up at mom's house again at his ex-wife's house shows up again and tony's sister was there to witness this and so he walks in mom turns just like she had before turns her back looks out stares out the window hey i just want to come talk to you and see you still won't look at so he goes to the other side of the bed and he puts his hand on his shoulder he says look i understand why you don't want to look at me i understand you have every right to be angry with me i was a hor- i was horrible to you i was a horrible husband i cheated on you all that stuff i, I just treated you badly But I want you to know I'm sorry for what I did. Will you forgive me? Silence. So he gets up, turns, starts to head out the door, and he hears rustling, like blankets, sheets moving. He turns around, and she's turned to look at him. And she said to him, if there's a God who can make you ask someone for forgiveness, I want to know him. And Tony was like, that's how my mom became open to the gospel of Jesus. Because... She knew he claimed to be a Christian, but she's kind of like, yeah, whatever, this guy, he's, what a butthole, like, I, no way, you know, I, uh, no, what, I don't care, but she saw him apologize and heard that, she wasn't able to see Jesus till he decreased, so he was like, I will humble myself and become small and let Christ increase in my life, and then she could see Jesus. Now, I think there's a lot of grace in what John the Baptist says, grace for himself. But I, I picture in the I must decrease, he must increase, I must decrease. I picture that being a decreasing process. I think that's very, very clear. There's a pro- decreasing is a process, and paradoxically, it means you're growing spiritually. While you're decreasing, you're growing spiritually. But there also, notice, there has to be some determination in it also. John the Baptist says, He must increase. That's God's will. I must decrease. There's there's determination in that. There's fight in that. Like, I have got to move forward spiritually. There's got to be repentance and turning and change in my life. I must decrease. And that's a process that theologians call sanctification. Like, we're slowly becoming more and more like Christ so that people can see Jesus as we decrease that's how it works. And I'm a big fan of just saying every once in a while, it's good to take inventory, to look at my life and for you to look at your life and to say, if I have become a follower of Jesus, if I've put my faith in Jesus, do I look any different than I did five years ago? In this process of following Jesus, if I'm following Jesus, that sanctification, like this is what, look over the last five years and say, do, do I humble myself more than I did five years ago? Do I take out the garbage more than I did five years ago? Do I serve children more than I did five years ago? Do I apologize more than I did five years ago? Like, and if you've seen progress, you've got to celebrate that and be like, man, I'm decreasing. Like Christ is becoming more visible in my life. There's been progress. If you haven't, 
then you haven't seen the progress in the last five years. And, and you say you follow Jesus, you've put faith in Jesus. You have to get serious about it, like seriously. Like quit screwing around and say, I must decrease. I've got to fight forward to actually be serious about my repentance and my turning to God. I must decrease so that people can see Jesus in my life. Uh, after Hank Pym became Ant-Man, he became one of the founding members of a little superhero team called the Avengers. And uh, he was in the first like old school picture of the Avengers in that story. He's, he's one of them, little Ant-Man, Hank Pym. But eventually in 1979, another character was introduced to the Marvel Universe in the comics. He was an ex-convict, a reformed thief, and an electronics expert. Anyone know his name? Scott Lang, that's my dog drawn in the back, Jason Campbell. It's my superhero mentor I mentioned last week. Scott Lang, so Scott Lang in the movies, uh, Hank Pym is played by Michael Douglas, okay? And then Scott Lang is played by Paul Rudd. So if you can remember like that first movie um, and how that kind of originated. But Scott Lang was hired by Stark International and in an effort to help his sick daughter, Scott Lang eventually steals the Ant-Man suit from Hank Pym. It's no longer a potion. That's now the technology is the suit itself. And so he steals the suit from Hank Pym. And Pym had long since given up the name Ant-Man. But when Pym finds out, he gives the suit to Scott Lang and allows him to become the second Ant-Man. And so Scott Lang goes on to become an Avenger and serve as an Avenger for many years. And my point is, just like with a lot of superheroes, there's been more than one Ant-Man in the Marvel Universe. Um, let me close with this. Jesus... It tells us, before being born in Bethlehem, Jesus was the infinite word of God, the eternal word of God, God the Son, you know, we'll call him. He was gigantic, infinite God in heaven. But when he saw our need for a savior, he saw that we needed power from the outside, we needed help, he got small, he shrank. He became one cell, then a zygote then a newborn baby in Bethlehem, and then a man. Jesus was the ultimate Ant-Man. That is the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for us. But as he walks around this world, before he dies on the cross for our sins, he walks around this world. One of the things he says about John the Baptist, right before John the Baptist was executed, is he says, Jesus, it says, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Like, this is Jesus saying, J the B is the goat, man. He is the goat. He's the greatest of all time. Now, obviously, Jesus is humbly not counting himself, who was born of a woman. He's saying, this is the greatest man that's ever. Can you imagine Jesus calling you the goat? Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest who had ever lived, and so he was the one, ironically, who was decreasing, becoming small, becoming Ant-Man. You know, he was, ironically, the goat, the greatest. Then Jesus continued, and he said, Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, existing there and here, God's kingdom anywhere, whoever is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So the idea is, you can become even greater in Jesus's eyes. In Jesus' eyes, the way to become great, the way to become the goat is by becoming Ant-Man, by becoming smaller, decreasing, bending down, serving, becoming more humble. There can be more than one Ant-Man in our universe also. Let's pray.